Hello, and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. It's a good house full this morning. My name is Farah, which I remembered just about. <laughs> I'm so asleep. My name is Farah, and I am the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. A very warm welcome to you all. And so to our speaker, Vas Maroulas was born on a small island in Greece called Patmos, where the Book of Revelation was written in 90 AD. Vas's father was a doctor and his mother was an English teacher. As he grew up in these idyllic surroundings, Vas developed a passion for maths and physics and an absolute love of music. He studied mechanical engineering at the Technical University of Athens, and after graduation, there came a pivotal moment in Vass's life where, at the age of 22, he received two confirmed job offers. One was at an engineering consultancy, and the other was as an actor for the Greek National Opera. <laughs> I love this sense of drama and Greek mythology and touch of Greek tragedy. His his first job was starting at 9 o'clock at the engineering consultancy and his second job was starting at 10 o'clock at the Royal Opera House. Standing in the middle of the pavement in Athens, he was looking in two opposite directions and he could never quite decide so he had deliberately double booked himself. He finally took one step forward towards the engineer's office, thus sealing his fate. He continued to work in Athens for another three years. To broaden his horizons, Vass decided to come to London, initially for two years. In 2004, the Greek economy was in a robust state, and whilst there were many opportunities, Vass felt he wanted to enrich and widen his thinking. Arriving in London in 2004, Vass worked and studied for his master's at Imperial College. Whilst in London, he decided to secure a role at Arab, where he was drawn by the firm's reputation for striving for excellence and its people. He was interviewed by our wonderful Andy Sedgwick, and since then, he's worked with an array of architects, including David Chipperfields, Amanda Levitt, and Tony Fretton. And some of his projects include a more Pacific HQ in Seoul, Danza Municipal Hall in Belgium, Sky Central, and the Royal Academy of Arts. Bass continues his love of music, and he's the director of the Music Conservatoire in North London, and he's also teaching vocals um, and a director at the choir of the Greek Orthodox Church. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the enigmatic Vas Maroulas. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Farah, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being here today. So I would like to start my talk by saying that I'm neither an architect nor a structural engineer. And maybe you would expect a subject such as parametric design to be addressed by someone who embraces the skills of designing you know, forms, mass, and volume rather than cables and pipes. Having said that, perhaps you would indulge me in reflecting upon the subject of parametric design and expand into the use of data and information technology in our profession. In the past few years, the information revolution, in a similar way to the industrial revolution that took place 200 years ago, has started having such a considerable impact in our industry, dominating to an irreversible degree the way we design, communicate, and deliver buildings. Observing that change, it has intrigued me how the digital technology and the availability of information in abundance has started shaping our industry and our engineering profession. Parametric design is one of the key areas that have been strongly influenced and facilitated by the power of digital technology. And although I will start my talk by touching upon the history and evolution of parametric design, I will then consider the way our industry has reacted into the digital era and the risks and opportunities that lie ahead. Before I move on, I would like to attempt to give a definition of parametric design that could be something along the lines of 
a design process that employs variable parameters or algorithms to generate geometries, shapes, or forms. Or, if I'm allowed to put it slightly differently, we could say that parametric design makes use of the digital technology and the computational power to create architectural forms and engineering solutions which are based on the interrelationships, and I think that's quite important, between a series of parameters. Patrice Schumacher's interpretation is that parametricism is architecture's answers to contemporary computationally empowered civilization. Now, if I make a bold assumption here, maybe, maybe if we pause for a minute and look back into the ancient civilization, maybe a similar design logic was present there. Parametric design and parametric architecture as a concept appear to have been originated in Italy by Luigi Moretti in 1940s, who researched the relationship between architectural design and parametric equations, and who by 1960, with the assistance of computers, he was able to exhibit models of parametric design in Stadia. The earlier work of Anthony Gaudi is also parametrics and bears important similarities to the work emerging from Frey Otto. Both of them worked with free forms inspired by the force of gravity as one key parameter. They used hanging models to shape architectural forms following the shape that gravity imposes on materials. For example, Anthony Gaudi used the model I showed in the previous slide in 1900 to design the structure of the church of the Colonia Guel, of which he later made use in the Sagrada Familia. Moving on to 1970s, there is another example where parametric modeling were used by engineer Frey Otto to inform the design of the roof of the Olympic Stadium in Munich. A recent example from our times is a low carbon sustainable development we did in Helsinki with Saubru Katon, where the interaction of natural forces of sun and wind were used as the parameters that shaped the form of the buildings and their special relationship with each other. The key difference that the digital technology brought into parametric design is that the computational power is the computational power which automated the process and enabled us to examine a large number of parameters in virtual environments. As this process is being digitalized, the question is to what extent maybe it removes human intervention and designer's intuition. Or to put it slightly differently, to what extent it becomes a design tool that is based on numerical processing rather than on general understanding of key physical principles. I will leave that thought hanging there with you whilst I canter on. Recently, as parametric design becomes more and more popular as a term, a kind of a buzzword, at the same time, a progressive criticism is being heard. For the purposes of this morning's talk, here is my humble interpretation. Whilst parametric design generates beautiful and elegant forms and shapes, leading to emblematic buildings, the engineering sometimes has to work especially hard to reach the extremities of physical laws. And although in some cases, architecture and engineering are so well integrated together that it is hard to distinguish one from another, criticism is being heard that iconic architecture is driven by shape and form rather than functionality and efficiency of materials. Possibly, possibly, we as designers have not placed enough emphasis on communicating its practical and functional advantages. Here is another quote from Professor Philip Bloch, which maybe we should all reflect upon. Whilst we contribute in creating these iconic forms, as illustrated by some of the previous buildings, I would like to raise the question whether parametric design 
is an expression of artistic exuberance or whether the advancement of the digital technology is an opportunity for us as designers and engineers to use parametric design for the greater good of society. Parametric design has been associated in all these years to forms and shapes and almost exclusively used by the architectural profession and structural engineers. To my view, parametric analysis can be broadened to consider wider topics such as productivity, such as well-being, such as energy efficiency and life cycle costing. In our times, this can be facilitated by the advancements of the digital technology and the availability of computational power. At this point, I would like to share with you a few examples which support that view. So, back in 2010, we designed a low-carbon sustainable development with Saubro Hatton in Helsinki. And the client's objective was to achieve a low energy building through the implementation of energy reduction measures that stand true to a life cycle analysis. Every single proposal, including passive techniques, energy efficiency, renewable technologies and so on, were parametrically studied to be individually optimized against their return on investment. However, this was a preliminary analysis and approach. The analysis included a manual Excel-based process, which although it offered some conclusive results, it suffered from long computational times. It lacked the coherence that would have been brought and achieved if the interrelationships of those parameters in question had been studied. Seven years later, for the new six buildings at University of Northampton, we ran a test um, where we adopted a truly parametric analysis to optimize energy efficiency. The objective there was to reduce capital costs while achieving the optimum energy savings. A key part of the optimization process was to study the main engineering parameters and facades, such as the fabric of the envelope, lighting, HVAC systems, shading strategy, while maintaining the architecture form of the building. The main attraction there of the parametric analysis we did is that it allowed the simultaneous evaluation of the different conflicting design parameters. The algorithm looked into all possible solutions, identifying only those which satisfied the criteria of minimum capital cost and maximum energy reduction. Those were then used by the client's team during the decision-making process. Another example, which we come across quite often, is the carbon story. The constant discourse of energy efficiency is indeed important. However, we need to look at this through a different prism, which also includes people's well-being, health and productivity. Parametric analysis presents us now with the opportunity to influence the building design, to foster well-being and behavioural change, as we later did in Sky Central. It is interesting to know that both examples that I just mentioned have been based on numerical evaluation and analysis. It is numbers, it is numbers that have driven the decision-making process. Is this posing a risk? Are we basing our engineering judgment just on numbers without using lateral thinking and actually overlooking the principles of engineering? Maybe it is what Platon or Plato said, a good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers. At this point, I would like to share with you an example from a completely different field, chess. Three years ago, in another breakfast with Arup Talk, our very talented Giulio Antonuto shared an example from Kasparov's games with computer Deep Blue, where the computer at game two made a strategic move rather than the obvious one. That might have indicated that the computer had a general understanding of the position rather than looking into numerically driven algorithms to choose the best move. Just recently, 20 years later, at the Penrose Institute, scientists came up with a problem, a chess problem, that computers failed to solve 
and also found that actually human players see the solution almost instantly, while chess computers consistently fail to find the right move. Point being that the digital optimization processes are programmed to solve certain problems, but maybe, maybe, lack the broadness of lateral thinking, intuitiveness and human knowledge. Here is a different perspective. As data becomes available in abundance, opportunities arise to influence multiple variables and enrich the engineering design with more numerical information. The challenge is that we as engineers are being driven by the availability of data rather than us driving into the direction we want sometimes. In some cases, it seems that we have surrendered ourselves from being inquisitive, from questioning and debating the answer we are offered, from delving into the details, from testing the results against the law of physics. We lose sight of simplicity. The fundamentals of engineering are simple principles and a good design ought to satisfy them. As parametric design and the digital processes are being established and their use is being extended throughout the design and construction phases, there is a risk of de-skilling ourselves. We are getting so immersed on that abundance of data and what it can achieve that maybe sometimes we forget that our profession have a wealth of skills and experiences that are being developed and learned on site. The challenge, or better the opportunity, is how do we take advantage of the digital world without abolishing the key practical and experience-based engineering skills? Maybe we need to reconsider the way we develop our skills to influence the use of parametric design and digital technology. It is a kind of a quest for a fine balance between optimum use of numerical data and creative use of humans' intuitiveness and knowledge. As industrial revolution took place and changed our world and the way we are and live today, information revolution unavoidably will do the same and indeed the complex world we live today will become even more complex and composite. Where numbers, multifaceted approaches and parameters will be part of our daily routines from optioneering studies to decision making. However, the question still remains how we will make use, how we will make best use of parametric design to continue bringing the emotion, the beauty, the knowledge, the instincts, sometimes even our failures as human beings in the design of our buildings. Thank you. I don't know if you have any questions. I just wondered, because training has also changed, right? But now, if you look at students, they have a very different training than maybe you and I when we came 10, 15 years ago. And I just wondered how you think, how you can train into activity, how you can train to have that um, natural thing. The situation we are at the moment is that we, all the, the new engineers, and I can talk only for engineers, the engineers that are coming on board and we are recruiting, and you know that, uh, they are coming so they are so good in digital technology. I mean, it's the natural thing. It's what they do naturally. For <laughs> our generation, it's not what we do naturally. It is what we've learned. But for them, it's what they naturally do. And in a way, you know, it's a, it's a world through digital. They see the world through digital tools. It's a completely different approach to what they see everything. You know, it's virtual realities. We are expecting at some point to be able to see our buildings 
through computers and walk them and through all our services and the structure being developed. So I think it's a challenge how we, we train them. And it's a challenge because the other, the other part of the world, which is the experience-based skills, is, you know, it's completely different. You touch it, you feel it. So bringing those two together is a challenge from universities, but it's also for our profession a challenge. I think how do we, do we mix the two? And I think we're in a quest. It's, it is a quest for us because it's a new world. And the, the most important thing for me, it's not a new world that we are entering. It's a new world that we are living in. It's happening. So there's no way back. Digital is everywhere. Huh? All of us have smartphones. So I think it's acknowledgement that we are in that world and then how we, we bring that balance together. There's something quite different about how you apply, say, parametric design to architectural design, where you want kind of creativity and flair and not to be driven just by function but by form. Potentially against how we can use parametric design in engineering and where a lot of what we do responds to rules of physics that are set out in set variables that will correspond to one another. How do you, do you see that there's a difference between the two? And do you think there's more of a risk to one part of the industry than to the other in terms of computers becoming more capable of automating what we might otherwise do manually through calculations that aren't currently that parametric? So first, you give me the opportunity to say a few stuff that, after a lot of thought, we thought we took out of the presentation. <laughs> so one of the observations, as I was researching into the subject, is that there is, and please don't shoot on that, there, there, there is a view that um, parametric design in the last five years has been marginalized. And Patrick Schumacher's view is that, and the main view is along these lines. And the main reason that it has been marginalized, and this is observed also in the universities, is that it is purely about shapes and forms. And one thing is what I've said earlier, that doesn't communicate its other functions. But the, the, the key thing is that it needs to address societal needs, societal subjects. Which in a way, so when by that I mean well-being, behavioral change, life costing, and analysis and things like that, which sometimes they are a little bit more dull, you know, talking about life costing, I'm sorry, QSS. But, you know, they are also very important, capital costs. And I think the engineers, the engineering side of parametric design has to play an important role. So I think it's a great opportunity here, a parametric design which is happening and it's, you know, it, it, it is here, there is an opportunity now to marry it, if you like, with engineering, parametric design in engineering. And, be a, and because we have the computational power, now we can do a lot more with you know, calculation, things like that. And so bring, demonstrate the other benefits of parametric design in the industry. And so our clients start understanding that it's not just about shape and forms, but we can do more things. The challenge, as we probably some of us know, is that the because it's digital, because it's about computational power, it's about the technology is not yet there, it's coming together, but we are not there to be able holistically to do a holistic parametric analysis. So that takes a bit of time. But I think if the first is acknowledging that it's happening so that all of us can you know, foster it or you know, support it. How would you communicate this complex shapes to a construction site? Do you see that it will shift towards fabrication in the factories rather than components assembled on site as we see it in traditional way? <coughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, ev eventually, I mean, we have already seen some prefabrication happening and some of, uh, in some of our buildings we are already in using that, but we are also, you know, experimenting with projects such as circular buildings where not about the circular logic but about the prefabrication element of it, we are starting using it more and more. And the, the, I think the benefits of prefabrication stand true that we will be able to, you know, get uh, built and manufacture things in a, in a protected environment or a safer environment like 
off-site and then bring it on-site. But I think at some point, <laughs> there will be also an element of fabricating on-site, actually having the tools, having the 3D printing or the 3D manufacturing, that we will be on-site and actually the construction industry will be manufacturing on-site, prefabricating there in a way. And, but this will take time and I think it's going to be a shift not as, as designers in delivering the project, the product in, in 3D or in a digital environment, but it will also be a shift of the construction of the contractors, of the, of the managers on site, that they will have to you know, react into a 3D environment and information that comes in 3D, which we see it happening, but takes a bit to take off. On the parametric design, I found quite interesting. I've come from a career of being a full-time musician my whole 20s, touring the world in the West End of Broadway. And I've noticed how the music industry has been affected by similar kind of technologies and the parametric design therein. And it has made a major impact on that world. And now working as an architecture, uh, as an architectural technician, uh, I'm noticing how the technologies are doing the similar kind of thing as what has happened to that in music and I think it's going to be quite an interesting next 10 years as the design process will probably require less and less people to do more and more but that does obviously influence um, the art therein. Yeah, I really like that. From Arup, you are acknowledging that this is happening. And um, I also do some things for the ballet, and it's happening a lot. And I feel that sometimes there are some companies that are taking on board, and some others that are taking a bit longer to get into it. But I'm very happy that the whole conversation is starting to happen. So I think that um, the partners are quite open to, not parametric in general, anything that can help to make a better design always as a tool, so not as something deterministic. And uh, within the office, I'm not pretty sure how much I can say, but we are starting to use it, certainly. As my, my personal view on parametric is that it's just another tool, but it's a very interesting tool. I, I thought it was fascinating. I think it's hit, hit a very interesting point. Um, you know, the parametric architecture is definitely going the way of the future. I mean, we, in, in our practice, we're completely uh, trying to adopt it. I mean, it's, it's still hard because people still need to be educated and learning what's, what's the potential of it. Um, but it was definitely good to see that it's sort of getting picked up by more and more people. And the, the more information we can, personally, I think, the more information we give the, to the computers, the better informed decisions we're going to be able to make. The, the, I mean, the more complex a, a solution space we create for ourselves, um, the better solutions we can eventually get to. I think, I personally believe, the computers will eventually automate most of what we are doing at the moment. It's just a matter of getting all the information and the designer will slowly recede. I, <laughs> which is slowly, which is might be slightly pessimistic point of view, but I, I think it's, it's good. I think we'll get interesting and novel design from it.